Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Institute, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, not so many, I think. Housekeeping first. Um, please, like myself, either turn off your mobile phone or turn it to silence. And the emergency exits are the same as the ordinary exits, uh, the doors through which you came through. But be assured that underneath the original 18th century Latvian oak planks, there is steel reinforcement. Um, our guest today is Jenny McCoy, uh, Chief Executive of the Irish Business and Employers Confederation, who is well known to everybody. He has uh, a varied and distinguished career, both in academia uh, and in business, that I won't go through. Uh, he's a person of authority. He's been described by the Irish Times as one of the 50 people who run Ireland. I have to have a discussion with him because I don't think we agree on who the other 48 are. <laughs> um, but he's going to talk to us about um, a recent publication uh, by IBEC on uh, Ireland in the EU 27, a dynamic future, uh, which I think is something that does need to engage us very closely. To the point where I'm delighted to say the Institute and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade have agreed on a project uh, which we will carry out uh, to look at the future of Ireland within EU 27 after Brexit. Um, because although we're concerned about the immediate issues of what's going to happen about Brexit, which personally I think is going to turn out badly for everybody, we do need to, to, to think uh, quite systematically and quite seriously about what kind of EU 27 uh, we would like to see uh, and what kind of role we see Ireland uh, playing in an EU 27 without the UK. Um, there's a lot that can be said about that. Um, and we'll get around to it a bit later on, but first I think uh, we'll hear Danny uh, present his idea of a dynamic future. If you take 15, 20 minutes, Danny, the um, speech will be on the record and the Q&A session afterwards will be off the record, so it will be gloves off then, intellectually speaking. Danny. Alan, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as Alan kindly gave me the introduction, um, I'm fortunate to be the CEO of IBEC, the, uh, by far the largest business uh, representative organisation in Ireland, but also actually one of the largest in Europe, which is a reflection of the scale of the business footprint here in Ireland, um, a disproportionate size of business actually to the scale of the population. Um, there is no other part of Europe that has the concentration of the scale of business that transacts from Ireland, both in its global nature but also in its, its reach and the diversity of sectors that are covered. And so IBEC represents over 42 different sectors and part of the work behind this uh, project of Ireland and the EU, we spoke to our members to try to get a sense, particularly driven by President Juncker's call for the various um, scenarios or various aspects of, of Europe. And kind of cut to the chase, I suppose, in those options if they were discrete. Um, the business community really would prefer the option of carrying on. And of course, when you, you know, setting up scenarios for future strategies, uh, there's always one that's kind of the status quo, and of course, that's the one you're not supposed to like. Because who wouldn't be for change? Why else would you be going through the expensive exercise of the strategy just to, uh, just to be where you are? So, you know, the equivalent of driving a thousand miles to be photographed in front of your car. You know, just, uh, why would you take the journey if you're just going to be in the same place? But actually, when you stood back from where the European Union has uh, emerge to. Sure, there are, lots of, there are lots of problems, lots of inconsistencies, lots of things not to like, but actually what is to like and what are the successes uh, are immense and really dominate and are seen to dominate uh, by the business community. So the, the view in having a look at do more with less and less and, and more, yeah, there are nuances in what is in this document, but really if you're looking for the nutshell, uh, the Irish business community like the way the European Union has been developing. It's steady, strong, dealing with the crisis, 
However, and it's always at the back of our mind, there still has to be a question in the future of Europe for Ireland is that all of this future of Europe debate, we'd probably come to the same conclusion with Britain in the European Union. Obviously, something has changed or is about to change that could be a destabilizer for the Union, but particularly difficulties for Ireland, but still even cognizant of that when we talk to our members and the focus groups here, still believe that our, our, our destiny very firmly lay in the European Union because not just of its past successes, but also for the future and see that as a dynamic, uh, a dynamic future. And so the priorities is, you know, I don't want to rehearse it, we all in this room know about the transformation of our society on the back of, of EU membership. There is still a belief that there is a lot more, particularly along on the innovation, et cetera, that can be tapped into uh, by Irish business, even in the absence uh, of Britain being in that Europe. And it's kind of difficult to see, so uh, I'll, I'll just go through. This is the only other slide I, I have here. So these six priorities on the future of Europe uh, I might just touch upon them and can do more in the Q&A. But effectively, the first priority that was coming through right across the sectors was to unleash the potential of the single market and particularly digitalization. And it's still the case, if we look at the four freedoms, that in the services-based economy, predominantly and increasingly where the value added in many societies are embedded in the services component, uh, that Europe still has quite a bit to go in completing that single market particularly around services. And obviously with the advent of, of digitalization being pervasive right across all kinds of businesses, the larger the block, uh, the better. And particularly again, just to you know, reiterate what we, what we all know, is that Europe as a share of the globe uh, is declining. Uh, that's very true in terms of population dynamic, but increasingly that occurs then in terms of economic activity, so that even in a globalized world that's expanding, the dynamic for the European Union should be trying to get bigger in the things that we are good at together, uh, but still having acknowledgement of proportionality and subsidiarity to decide what are the things that would be distracting in the next decade away from this innovation and dynamic uh, Europe that business would like to have. So the unleashing of the potential will be very significant. Also then, with this protectionist uh, trend, I suppose, from across the Atlantic in the current administration, Europe really can play a leading role uh, globally in trade and investment. And of course, one of the features here that sometimes get lost in the debates is Investment is actually more significant than trade. Investment is the first issue, and trade increasingly flows. The world of David Ricardo and uh, Adam Smith, of countries that were very defined by their natural resources and by specialization trading with each other, was coming from the natural assets of that country. Uh, Ireland's only natural asset, bar the human capital, uh, that we have, you know, it's probably just grass. And remarkably, in the last number of generations, we've actually made that grass work for us significantly and transformatively. From just feeding live cattle to be our largest export in the 1970s, we now have one of the most significant dairy industries globally on the back of infant formula and uh, sports uh, nutrients and so on. If you look at Glambia, it's now the largest the largest sports and nutrient company in the world. And I haven't even talked about the Kerry Group, or even bigger again. Um, so that's trade, and the natural trade. But actually, Ireland has more significant trade flows in terms of biopharma and medtech, but those are investment decisions originally. So to look at trade flows and get focused in on trade can sometimes blinker us to this kind of geographies. Uh, and natural assets, increasingly the big issue for global trade is actually the story around investment. Investment decisions drive trade flows. Um, and so being very much, yes, tariffs and so on are, are you know, much more in our conversation than they would have been before Brexit. Everybody's getting a bit more familiar with what customs unions means and what a tariff is and what's a non-tariff barrier. 
we still need to focus in that investment is actually the most significant feature uh, of the global world. And so making Europe an attractive place for investment um, and the conditions around investment uh, are very significant. And that's why issues around the capital markets, union, are very, very significant for uh, Europe to be that lead. The other feature that was coming through quite strongly was the embracing of a competitive uh, taxation policy. And again, obviously, this wouldn't just be the Little Islander uh, view of Ireland on this, although we quite happily uh, give expression to that. It's actually looking at the world as it is, not as how you <coughs> want it to be. And, you know, the, the continuous discussion of common consolidated corporation tax base um, as a kind of a lurking agenda out there, uh, gets at the root of this idea that unions should share. The question is, what's the appropriate sharing? And what's the appropriate unit of analysis? You know, what is to the state and what should be to the union? I think these will be debates that will, rightly in Ireland, should be very much in the vanguard of this, emerge through time. But very often, and we've seen this particularly since President Macron has, has um, moved uh, in the absence of other leadership in Europe for a while, uh, on the digital taxation issue. And again, this is obviously seen as sensitive in an Irish context, given the presence of um, Googles and Facebooks and Amazons and so on, is that this becomes very intra-European uh, conversations. Um, and whilst understandable, uh, given the nature of digitalization and uh, the high-tech companies mainly being American, um, it, it actually has a real danger for the whole European project. And that's sometimes missed. Uh, and the following is the logic of it. In trying to tackle digital taxation and where the revenue should be attributed to, there is a view that it should be at the consumer, the consumer who gives the information uh, with their data and so on, that they give over the resource, and where are the vast bulk of the consumers, it should be some kind of population-driven metric for the attraction of this revenue. That may have some impeccable logic within Europe to larger member states. But if you take that to its logical conclusion as a global taxation model, which will get hammered out in the next decade, probably at the OECD level, Europe is really following that principle will be handing over huge amounts of revenue to the emerging global population powers around the world, thereby putting huge stress on our European social model, which continues to need that kind of resources, particularly in a declining population in Europe. So going after one solution on today's problem could, in fact, for Europe, unleash a much more significant issue for where does the value of German car sales actually occur to? Where does the revenue go back to? It's a, it's a dangerous proposition. German car industry have come to, our, uh, come to our aid on this particular front, and that particular pro proposal looks like it's going nowhere fast. Um, but we, again, need to be not just the Little Islanders part of it. It is actually a comment for the wider European family. The last three, in conscious of time, is the um, respect the member state competencies to design labor market and social policy. I think this is probably much more pervasive for Irish businesses um, as a result of Brexit than perhaps it has been in some of our uh, contemporaries. Really a, a worry um, to ensure that the kind of creep of, of legislation, particularly in the labor market, uh, doesn't uh, give quite serious unintended consequences. One example that's, um, that's in the European level, we have lots of interesting, let's put it that way, in inverted commas, proposals from private member bills around the labour market in Ireland at the moment from uh, our political parties, including postal code redundancy. That's my term. Of, depending on what your postal code was, if you get laid off, depending on what what your home address was, you might be entitled to a different level of compensation from the same employer for losing the same job at the same time. Go think. Um, but anyhow, that's not a European one. The European one is the definition of a worker. 
Um, and that's a particularly interesting one for reasons we can understand, given some egregious behaviours. But taking it to its logical conclusion right now, this takes in all kinds of contracting, even at the level of the household, potentially um, having people on site doing what would be clearly seen as temporary jobs and may actually confer a relationship between employer and employee, depending on where this line gets drawn. So again, there's quite a lot of debate in, in, in Europe which would be more restrictive on labour market social policies, and again, the, the view coming back would be it's principle of subsidiarity to reflect the type of societies and the type of models that they have developed through time and how, how people organise their social policy and their labour market policies, rather than mm -hmm. having one size fits all. Clearly, I'll champion a better regulation. I can assure you, despite the popular narrative, most, ex and this is a clearly obvious point we think about, most existing businesses think regulation is a real positive because they're currently living and dealing with it and incumbent with it. Challengers that hate regulation, actually, in trying to break in. Um, most businesses, while you hear them gripe about regulation, actually the vast canon of regulation is something that people working with it have already embedded into their business model. And disruption around that is actually one of the last things they want or need. So while you hear a lot of cut red tape, bonfires of the regulations, while that is true at the margin, it still remains the case that most businesses see the canon of European regulation um, as a net positive and a beneficiary for the business model. All right? So sure, they gripe with stuff, but actually there is a realisation that the success of Europe has actually been as much driven by regulation uh, as the advantage of scaled consumer markets and so on. So I think that's a point. So the championing of, of better regulation certainly comes, comes out very strongly from that. And, and obviously regulation then that, that is reflective of a changing global market around innovation, data, digitalization, there would be a sense of Europe being, being able to act faster on regulation, but it's not a, a no regulation. You would see regulation as a kind of a very net positive for, for building a strong, uh, a strong business. And the final piece was ensuring that the fiscal rules are in tune uh, with all member states. And in the Irish context, I suppose, this really um, kind of manifested, but the one that we're actually talking about here is being in a society with an expanding population, that the fiscal rules around current stroke capital expenditure could be more nuanced to take account of an expanding population to take what are necessary capital investments not to be included in a rule for what really is dealing with cycles and the kind of current expenditure. So kind of the way businesses would deal with capital expenditures themselves, they do not see that necessarily reflected in the fiscal rules and believe then that they're too binding um, as a result. So that's kind of just a, a kind of a top of the um, priorities on the future of Europe. The document and, and so on behind this is a bit more extensive and goes in. I've just been really touching over the top and giving you a flavour it, so um, much more uh, contained within. But again, to summarise, um, we launched this in Brussels in uh, March. Uh, we had very significant um, presence of... It was launched by President Tajani, Michel Barnier was a summer up of it, and four commissioners. <coughs> Uh, we're at the event. That's a very big statement about Ireland, but also about business in Ireland. I think there is a realisation that Ireland is a frontier economy in many, many ways. And a lot of the marginal things that we're talking about here when it comes to taxation, digitalisation, expanding population, the type of restrictions could get no better place to have a debate on the future of Europe, I would contend, uh, than Ireland. And so the Irish business community really wants to be part, not just of Europe, but of that debate. And this is our first foray into that conversation. Thank you.